in harmony with each other and with the world. Um, the second is the crisis that uh, I, don't, I don't like CNN very much. I'm like a smoker, actually. You know, I know cigarettes are bad for you, but then you smoke them anyway. So I don't like CNN too much, but when I'm traveling, I turn it on for the news in English. And this morning, they, they had a report from Cairo about the crisis in food prices, bringing it very close to home. And that's something that's emerged uh, very, very recently. Um, by, by way of context, if we look back to when IFPRI, uh, that's the International Food and Policy Research Institute, began to track the real price of internationally traded feed grains and food grains back about 1960, Consistently, year by year, that international price was going down in real terms by a couple of percent per year. Many years, about 3%, until very recently. And suddenly, in the last year or two, the whole world has been turned upside down, and we can see this real crisis with reverberations in all sectors, not just of the industry that produces food and the industry that trades it internationally and that turns it into industrial products of various kinds, uh, but even more impacts on those who are at the end of that chain and most of all on those who don't have the flexibility in their incomes to cope with it. And, and the third is, a, is a, I suppose, almost a bureaucratic crisis. Uh, you know that the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, did a, a wonderful job over, I guess, seven or eight years of producing a series of, I think, four reports which progressively added and analyzed and synthesized uh, our view of what's happening to our, our, the climate in which we all live and produced a consensus at the end of that which is now driven policy and brought in even those countries that didn't want to believe in it, uh, brought them into the fold. And really, it's a turning point in human history as, as we confront that. But that came out of a, a very deliberate global attempt to produce uh, wisdom out of science and to turn that into policy and to turn policy into action. An attempt was made four years ago to do the same for food. Uh, on the initiative of the World Bank, they set up a thing called the International uh, Panel to, for, on the Assessment of Agricultural Research for AASTDs, AA, Agricultural Research for Sci Science and Tech for Development. At any rate, that panel has worked with hundreds of people uh, all around the world for the last four years. And just in the last couple of weeks, uh, their report has been finally put together and is due to be issued, I think, formally very shortly. But the crisis that I speak of is that after four years, they've been unable to reach consensus. In fact, it largely broke down because of disagreement uh, over fundamental issues concerning the way in which the promise of science as it's emerging today can and should be translated into action. So against that background, uh, I want to hand you over to our, to our three very distinguished speakers, uh, the first of whom, of course, is Ismail Sarageldin. Uh, no point in reintroducing him because he's, he's well known to you all, but I think he's come through uh, so many careers now that it's difficult to find a, a title that actually suits him. Scholar, perhaps, uh, but perhaps statesman. At any rate... Uh, Ismail, um, you'll justify the introduction. Thank you, Professor Cunningham. Uh, colleagues, this is a long day, but this is an even more important session, and I'm glad that you're here to participate in it. I think uh, Paddy Cunningham, our chair in introducing the session, summarized very much three extremely important issues. Yes, climate change that affects everything, including our relationship with the green plants who are on this earth, and we need always to be reminded of the wise words of Swaminathan who said, remember that we are all here as the guests of the green plants and those who tend them, the farmers and the plants. Without them, we wouldn't have the climate, we wouldn't have the food, we wouldn't have anything that allows us to exist. And of course, the food part and the crisis in the price that comes with it 
and the inability to generate a consensus. And he mentioned in passing a word that I would like to, to, to use as my takeoff for what I want to say. He said, we learn to live in harmony. I use that in a concluding slide to work in harmony with nature for the next generation and for the world in my keynote to this conference. And living in harmony is indeed at risk. Today, our societies, instead of seeing the benefits of this third global revolution of knowledge, are seeing those who have get more and those who have not get further left behind. They see in the passionate words of Richard Ernst, whom you heard in the opening session, the food of the poor being burnt to provide fuel for the cars of the rich. They see such inequalities that it actually in a, happened that in a session that I chaired in Washington, D.C., a president of an African country said to a group of Europeans we were with in that session, he said, if there is justice in this world and there is reincarnation, then me and my people should be reincarnated as cattle in your countries. And so everybody was shocked and he said, because without any effort, we would receive every morning twice the per capita income that my people and I have in Africa. You rich Europeans are subsidizing your cattle at two euros per day when the average per capita income of many of these poor African countries is less than one euro a day for a human being. Is that just? Is that fair? Is that a way of establishing harmony for the future? I think we are at risk, my friends. We are at risk that we are taking a turn in what promised to be a dazzling century of new science, new achievement, enormous improvements, and even the possibility of putting behind us the specter of war as we moved forward, inspired, inspired, I repeat, by the European example, the European idea. Why do I say inspired by the European example and the European idea? Because Europe, that has been drenched in blood, Europe that has been divided, Europe that has fought countless and endless wars, Europe an incredible mosaic of languages, religions and ethnicities, Europe despite the presence still of wars and ethnic wars in the Balkans that we witnessed, Europe showed in the last 50 years that yes, the impossible could be done. And that the dreamers like Jean Monnet and Schumann, who with the blood of the Second World War barely over, could imagine a day when French and Germans would never fight again. Could imagine a day where they would put their hands together and build together a new future. It was not easy going. But they succeeded. They succeeded beyond the wildest dreams that anybody could have said. They succeeded in saying, yes, France and Germany fought in 1870, they fought again in 1914, they fought again in 1939. But we can imagine the day where they will be friends and where they will create a new Europe. And those dreamers succeeded. It started with iron and steel, it went on to lots of other things, but it went on from a small common market of six to 15. We have a generation of young Germans and young Frenchmen who cannot imagine that their countries would go to war over anything. And yet, 
their fathers and grandfathers did go to war with each other. They showed that this was possible and that it could be expanded, that it could include something called social equity, that the European idea stood for more, for more than just a common market for goods and services that it was not just a place for capital flow. They, yes, they could achieve the removal of political boundaries. Schengen is a reality. The euro has become a reality. And all of that has been achieved, but more importantly, the Maastricht Agreement that talked about the social solidarity of Europe. And they did that while recognizing the differences between people. And so this Europe that has now grown to 27, that is discussing, rightly, wrongly, whatever, but is discussing even further restructurings that are required. That Europe has given the world a lot, including that example. And I ask that Europe now to expand that European idea, to expand it to the rest of the world. At a time of crisis, at a time of danger, at a time of fear, the time when, as Paddy Cunningham said, food prices are rising, riots have occurred in many countries, things are likely to get much worse before they get better, we have to cope with a new form of solidarity. And I'm happy and proud and honored to say that a group of talented individuals I see many of them in the hall, and I must mention my good friend Mark from Montague, who was really the first person to speak to me about this, but many of the others who are co-founders of this movement are here. The idea of European Action for the Global Life Sciences, the acronym that we have come to refer to as EAGLES. EAGLES, a choice of a bird that soars above the land that's way above and sees the big picture. And yes, that soars higher than other birds, and that's a challenge to go higher than emotions, higher than politics, higher than barriers, higher than the mundane and the feasible, to dream of what can be and what should be. And this organization, which I'm proud and honored to serve as the as first chairman, has David McConnell as its vice chairman from Europe and Hwa Min Yang as vice chairman from the developing world and a group of very distinguished scientists on both sides among the developing world and among Europeans with an intention to create a partnership, a partnership where we can bring the best of European know-how to bear on the problems of the poor. And we have moved just from being advocates to actually promoting implementation of projects, project on food, project on health, and we participate in many places calling for a vision similar, for example, to the one that my friend Peter Singer achieved in Canada when he talked about Canada really committing 5% of its global research budget to the problems of the poor. That was a brilliant view adopted by us in Eagles as well, because what it means is that, in fact, without saying give the money to the poor, if you fund the projects that concern the poor of the world, I think people, whether they're sitting in Utrecht or in Wageningen or in Delft, or in Zurich or wherever will have a vested interest in reaching out to scientists in Ethiopia, in uh, Egypt, in uh, uh, Brazil, in uh, India, in Bangladesh, in Central Asia, wherever, because that's where the problems are. And the bridges will flow, and the bridges will flow two ways. And that most magical of all things that we all know and all possess and all beloved, which is knowledge. 
It is the one commodity that I can come in and I have it in my mind and I can give it to you freely and I listen to you come in and give me your knowledge freely and I have kept my knowledge and I have gained yours. I live richer and so do you. We are both the richer for these bridges that are being built. We are both the richer for being able to overcome obstacles that try to stop this free flow of information and we are even richer if we collaborate together with your stock of knowledge and my stock of knowledge to build new knowledge that is available to the world, to solve the problems of those who are less fortunate than ourselves, to tackle the problems that challenge our concept of a common humanity. That is the challenge we are at today. And that is the promise of the bridge-building institution that is Eagles. And that is a challenge that we need also in the North to recognize, to recognize the achievements that are going on in the developing world, achievements that have come with collaboration and cooperation and openness, but also recognize the talent and ability of the local people in practically every one of those developing countries where unsung heroes fight against lack of funds, lack of resources, political instability, difficulties that would cripple most people who are used to a much friendlier research atmosphere. And yet they struggle on, motivated and moved by a commitment to bring the best of science to its fruition to serve the benefit of humanity. And so my friends, as we enter this session, and you'll hear from my other colleagues, it is with great pride that I say, I invite you all to become members of EAGLES, supporters of EAGLES, because after all, it is a global life sciences that we're talking about. And to accept the motto of the eagle that soars so high, the one that has inspired us to choose that acronym for our institution, and look at a world that others do not see and look at things as they could be. And rather than look at the world that is today and simply throw up our arms and say why, we should look at the world as it could be and say why not. And not only that, like Gandhi taught us, let us be the change that we want to see. Let us be the ones that shall ensure that that wanted future shall 